Listeners should always consult their health care provider for professional medical advice. I think that's what uh, human society will eventually evolve into, uh, starting going in that direction. You had mentioned you were a patient number with the late Roger Lear. What number were you? Number 15, and then there were two other patients after me, uh, 16 and 17. And um, a movie was made about patient 17. Tell me, and, uh, tell me about patient 17. Um, his name was Emil. I don't, I don't remember his last name. I don't know if he'd want to mention on the air anyway. But um, he had um, uh, a um, an implant uh, in his wrist, a small one, the smallest one I've seen so far. And um, uh, uh, we, Dr. Lee removed it. Uh, it showed up on ultrasound. Uh, luckily, and it disappeared off ultrasound for a while. Um, the aliens apparently have a way to make these implants disappear off uh, instruments for a while. Um, I know we've seen them disappear off x-rays before. I doubt the devices work in that state, otherwise they'd keep them that way all the time, but um, um, they have some way of um, uh, having them evade detection for short periods. And. Um, um, we removed the device and I analyzed it with um, the instruments I had available to me at work and um, sent uh, some of it out for uh, uh, ICPM mass trace element uh, and isotopic analysis. And uh, it turned out to be uh, an extraterrestrial device, um, um, a lot like the others, I, I guess, but I, I, I couldn't detect any carbon nanotubes in this one. I don't know if that was because it was just too small or at too low a concentration or or to support any, but um, uh, was, um, it's all been very interesting, to say the least. And patient 17 was on the, uh, the film, was about Dr. Lear primarily, wasn't it? Yeah, um, I just saw it for the first time uh, recently, and I was surprised how much I was on camera. But, um, yeah, it was about um, the, the removal and Dr. Lear um, mainly. Why do you think nobody's picked up his slack? Uh, they're probably scared to. I know uh, Dr. Matriciano, that uh, was his partner in the removal aspect of it, um, didn't really want to talk about UFOs or aliens and um, um, seemed scared. And I think he was just doing it as a, a favor to Roger. But, um, oh, by the way, George, I remembered the guy that uh, said he thought it was a hybrid. It was Bob Dean. You knew him, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he was um, uh, one of the best ufologists I've seen, besides Dr. Lear, I guess. <laughs> and good old Stanton Friedman, God rest his soul, huh? Yeah, yeah, we've lost a lot of people in this field. Have they been replaced? I don't think so. Not really. I mean, um, um, we're getting to be uh, some of the old guard now, I'd say. Um, but... Um, uh, no, I don't think that the uh, people coming into the field are uh, as good as the old ones. I know um, um, Wendell Stevens was a great loss as well. Yeah, exactly. Let's go to the phones. East of the Rockies, Joe, Long Island, New York. Joseph, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Steve. A couple of questions and a comment. Uh, sure, sure. First would be, you know, you mentioned on the ground basis. I'm kind of interested in what they would have on the ground besides bases. And also, that would indicate that there were people somewhere building these bases. Who might that be? And how would they would probably know what it involved? And that means that a lot of people are keeping their mouth shut, it seems like. My second question would be, what are some of the second and third uh, things they're interested in besides their programs? that you can discern, like what other things. Are there uh, woman-type figures, and could they be like spies, for example, like maybe uh, getting together with some prominent po politician as a hybrid? And then my comment is, uh, I, you know, when people talk about UFOs coming from light years away, that seems to me impossible. Uh, it's just too far. It's just there's no known way of traveling that distance that we can even fathom, I think. Well, they've learned how to bend space and time, haven't they, Steve? Um, yeah, the, the aliens use um, anti-gravity craft, and um, 
they can um, uh, create gravitational fields field so powerful that they can open wormholes. Um, and uh, I think they also have, a, have permanent wormholes, um, like a cosmic subway system. But even without that, they can, they can open a wormhole and travel several million kilometers and go through it. Wormholes are unstable, but they can go through it before it collapses and then repeat the process and uh, travel faster than light that way. But no, it, it's not impossible. I, the US, I have reason to believe that the U.S. government has faster than light travel. Uh, ben Rich, he used to run the Lockheed Skunk Works, uh, mm -hmm. said as much uh, in his final speech. He said we have the technology to take E.T. home, but um, it's all classified and it would take an act of God to get it out. Some believe these are dimensional. What do you think? What do I think about them being dimensional? Yeah, as opposed to planet. Um, I think there's there's some aliens that, that come from other dimensions. I'm not sure which ones. Uh, I know interdimensional travel from what uh, they've told me is possible. And um, they have, I know the Greys have time travel, for example. And I know that they, um, they don't like to use it very often because um, they, they said that you it's possible to get trapped in an alternate reality and, and you'd find it difficult to get back. Um, you'd have to find the exact branch point in time uh, that that alternate reality branched off from uh, in order to get back, and it might be difficult. And they also don't like to uh, use it because they're, they're fiends for 10 decimal point accuracy, and it's, it's difficult to time to the exact second when you're going to come out if you use time travel. But they do use it um, uh, sometimes if they want to... Uh, take somebody for longer than, than three to five hours. The standard abduction is three to five hours long, and uh, if they want to take you for longer periods, they um, use time travel to take you back to a time within three to five hours of when they when they took you. How did, how did they return you, Steve? Did they put you back wherever they picked you up? Yes, generally. Um, there's two ways they can take you. They can either... Um, uh, send uh, workers in to uh, float you out a window or just have you follow them out the door and then uh, use a gravity beam to uh, take you up to the craft um, hovering uh, uh, nearby or um, they can um, take you with a gravity beam like right through your roof. They can phase you through solid objects. They can walk through walls and stuff like that. Um, they can walk through solid objects. Um, and uh, the first way is called the easy way and uh, the second way is the hard way. You literally can dematerialize, can't you? Yeah, it's like they, they move the thing that you're phasing through aside a little bit in floor space, and it makes it um, kind of um, um, less real, I guess you could say. And you can go through it. It's something like that. I have vague recollections of going right through my attic when I was a kid. <laughs> How did they find you in the first place? Some, uh, somebody else in your family abducted? Yeah, my parents both um, uh, said they had uh, memories that indicated that they were probably abductees. Um, and um, the sister, my sister, the last time I talked to her, um, had um, an implant in her finger. Um, and she said uh, she, tried, she tried to dig it out and, and dug in further into her finger. So... Um, this is, a, this is a lineage thing, a bloodline thing. Usually everybody in the family is uh, affected. How do, how do we know you're not a hybrid? I don't. I mean, I, I have reason to believe I'm genetically modified. How much, I don't know. I feel different than other, than other people. My emotions are a little bit different, and um, the way I think about things is different. So. Were you always different growing up? Yeah. I've always found it very difficult to fit in. Do you have any friends? Uh, yeah, I've always had a few close friends, but um, I've never been like a social butterfly or anything. But um, uh, I find it a lot easier to relate to people uh, that are other experiencers. Um, uh, it was really a breath of fresh air to start going to the UFO conventions and meet other experiencers. Um, it's like um, one other experiencer described it as um, being, a, uh, being somebody like me or somebody like him. It's like having an invisible kick beat sign on your back where... Other people just, you know, get upset with you for no reason or just uh, you rub them the wrong way for reasons they can't describe, you know what I mean? Next up, let's go to Greg in Maui and Hawaii. Welcome to the program. Hey, Greg, go ahead. Hey, aloha to both of you, and thank you so much for your good work. 
Um, I, like Steve, had a nine-year-old experience, but it wasn't a physical abduction. It was I was sleeping in my bed, and they took me out of my body in my dream state, in a light body, and through the roof, like he said, the attic. <laughs> and then I ended up in the ship. But I was treated with complete respect and reverence, and they called me one of the chosen ones, and that they were going to connect me in my life with very many people. And I have met the pilot that flew the Roswell Christ remains, um, the Army Colonel Corso, who wrote the book The Day After Roswell. Uh, these are all Maui connections, because Maui's a pretty special place for over 40 years. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I never had any fear from them. I had nothing but respect. And, and they did honor their statement that said they were going to connect me with all these people. And the main question that I have regarding Mars uh, for Steve is um, there's an author named J.J. Hertak who wrote a book called The Keys of Enoch. Enoch was the Old Testament architect of the pyramids on Earth. And the pyramids on Earth are connected to the pyramids on Mars. And I'm just wondering whether, um, you know, Steve has heard of this book and the author. And he showed me the first pictures from Viking 2 of the pyramids and the face on Mars. And, um, you know, so I've had all these personal contacts because of that connect. And I don't know why I deserve it. You know, it, it, it led me on a strange life, but a wonderful life. And, um, you know, just like Steve, although I didn't have any negative experiences with them, I understand the hybrid stuff. I understand what, I mean, this is part of Colonel Corso's story is in the, the book today after Roswell. He talked about the graves uh, as being, they didn't have any sexual organs and they didn't have any um, abdominal digestive organs. They lived on sunlight, water, and air. And, you know, and then that's why they're experimenting with humans and trying to make these hybrids, because they were trying to figure out our reproductive stuff. <laughs> yeah, they reproduce by cloning. They've learned. J.J. Hertak was on our BeyondBelief.com uh, television show. By the way, there's uh, a great episode. I don't know if there's a connection between the Earth pyramids and the Mars pyramids. I don't know if there's some sort of physical connection, but I think the same people may have built both. That's conceivable. Do you think the asteroid belt was a planet that blew up, Steve? Yeah, that's what uh, Tom Van Flanders' theory, I think, it was very well thought out, and uh, he thinks that planets sometimes explode. And he thought that there were at least three planets in the system that exploded since its formation. And that neatly accounts for the late heavy bombardment uh, of the moon. Um, there, uh, after the, uh, the initial bombardment um, and planetary formation uh, ceased, um, about um, four, I think it was 400 million years later, there was all of a sudden uh, a heavy bombardment of, uh, by asteroids uh, on the moon and other bodies of the system. And uh, that was probably from one of the planets that exploded early on. And the asteroid belt, yeah, in my opinion, it definitely was, uh, was uh, the area of the remnants of the planet that exploded. Um, the nickel iron asteroids were part of the core. Palisites were part of the, um, the core uh, mantle boundary. And uh, the rest of the, uh, the asteroids, uh, the stony asteroids and meteoroids, uh, were part of the crust of that planet. Go west of the Rockies, Crystal's with us in Medford, Oregon. Welcome to the show.